Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I want to welcome everybody to the uh, Atlanta Church of Christ in Gwinnett Sunday School adult, uh, adult class, right? I and mean, we haven't had an adult class um, just in Meadow Creek at 10 o'clock in a while. It, f- it feels good to be here. Uh, our kids are learning in Kids Kingdom again, right? Uh, we got our, our first, our kindergarten through fifth graders in Kids Kingdom, and we've got our teens in the gym learning about God conversing about him, getting to know each other better as they get to know him better. It's just good for things to kind of approach another sense of normalcy, right? To be back to an old routine. And so today we're going to be, we're going to be talking about cultivating a deeper name again, cultivating a deeper name. Uh, And so this is going to be the class series for the month of March. So we're going to be talking about this uh, at 10 a.m. for all four, uh, all four weeks going forward. Uh, of March. And so when we talk about a good name, um, again, I said I gave a sermon about this about two months ago. And so we're going to be diving deeper into these concepts. Amen. You know, what does it mean to cultivate uh, a good name? And we should start by asking, you know, reminding ourselves, what is, what is it, what's in a name? What is a good name? And so when I'm talking about a good name, I'm talking about uh, reputation. How do people see you uh, when, they, when they approach you without having talked to you? What is your reputation? What are you known for? That's, a, that's what's in a name. And so a name can either repel people from you because you've got a bad reputation and they don't want any parts of you, or it can attract people to you because you've got a good name and they want to be involved with that. And so I want to start off with a question to you guys that are here. God has a glorious name, amen? Amen. Right? The Bible says that Jesus' name is above every name. And at his name, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Right? And so we know that God has a glorious name. My question to get us ready is why? What makes God's name glorious? That's a question to you guys. What makes God's name glorious? Dan? He keeps his promises. He keeps his promises. He keeps his promises. What else? What makes God's name glorious? Melvin? Unconditional love. Okay, unconditional love. Yeah, Buzzell. He can do anything. Say that again? He can, do anything. he can do anything. All right. Yeah. The function of the faith of the individual is regarded. Okay. So his name is, is highly regarded based on the people that, that regard him. Yeah, how they see him. Okay. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So what Jeff is saying, for those who can't hear it, I'm not sure if there's a mic on the crowd here, but what Jeff was saying was that, you know, depending on who you are and what you believe about God, the God of Jacob, um, of, of, um, of, of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac, um, that you may feel great about him or you may not feel great about him, depending on what you believe, as well as Jesus. That's a good point, brother. Peter. Yeah, reversing that, his faithfulness to us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Even when you're ignoring him, he's faithful to you. So it's faithfulness. Kenny. His victories and his uh, wonders. wonders, wonders of the past that built a reputation. Yeah. Ellen. Um, his righteousness. His righteousness. Because of all his, because of, of all he's made, all his creation. Okay. One more. Julia. He died to forgive us of our sins. So when we think about God's name, the things that we're thinking about really speak to what he's done. What's his reputation for what he's done and what he's capable of? And so when God has a good name, and even as Jeff mentioned, some people don't regard God's name highly because they don't believe in what he's capable of or think that, you know, it's real what he's done. So they don't have a high regard for him. But for those of us that believe about what he's done, his name is glorious. His name's glorious. And so that's what's in a name. And so we're going to just dive deeper into how we, as disciples, the people who claim the name of Jesus, what can our reputation do for or against Jesus? Our reputation can repel people from us and therefore repelling people from Jesus, or it can 
draw people to us and thereby draw people to Jesus. So we're going to be talking about, in cultivating a good name, about bringing glory to the name of God. And so there's four points. And when we talked about this a couple months ago uh, in the sermon called A Good Name, uh, we, talked about, we started uh, talking about Song of Songs. That's how we started to talk about the importance of a name. And in Song of Songs chapter 1, it started out with, uh, with a woman extolling the virtues of this hero of the Song of Songs. And she was amazed at his name. She was amazed at his reputation. Her, her, his reputation was attractive to her. And so his hero, our hero, had a phenomenal name in the community. But she was concerned because she wanted to be attractive to him. She was concerned about how her name was showing up to him. And so we see in verse 6 that she is talking to the daughters of Jerusalem. Let me get this to move. Okay. She was talking to the daughters of Jerusalem, and she was concerned. She said, how can I, I, I'm concerned because I've been spending all my time talking to my, taking care of my brother's reputations. In my own vineyard, I have neglected. And so she talked a lot about being concerned that he wouldn't appreciate the fruit of her name and thereby not be attracted to her. And so she used this concept of a vineyard, a neglected vineyard, to say, man, I really wish I had done a better job cultivating my reputation. And so we use that as our guideposts uh, to say, what does it take for us to cultivate our reputation? Because the reputation doesn't just show up. Right? We don't just show up and have a good name. Right? We have to do something. There's something, when you're looking at a vineyard, there's a lot that goes into making the wine that gives that vineyard a good reputation. And so we said, we looked at our name that same way. We looked at our name to say, you know, what does it take to build a good name? And so um, as this starts to move forward, I know we'll kind of get back to it. It looks like we're, we're having some difficulty. Uh, but as we move forward, we looked at four main aspects of a good name. Thinking in the, in the terms of a vineyard and cultivating a vineyard and being a steward of it. We thought about the soil, the vine, the fruit, and the wine. The soil, the vine, the fruit, and the wine. That's what we talked about when we talked about a good name. We talked about the soil being a persevering heart. That this is the foundation of all the things that we will grow in our lives. If we give up, we're not going to be able to build anything, much less a good name. And so a persevering heart was the foundation. Before you think about a vineyard, you got to make sure you have rich soil. And rich soil is a persevering heart. And we talked about that. And today we're actually going to be diving deeper into how do you cultivate a persevering heart? How do you get there if you're having trouble, tr uh, trouble giving, up, uh, giving up? Now, the next thing we talked about was a vine. We talked about the vine being the authority to which you submit. What do you submit yourselves to? Because the authority is authorities can do, earthly authorities can do a lot more through us than we can do through ourselves in the same way that a coach. You know, a coach will push you harder and make you run further than you could run on your own. And earthly authorities will do that for us. But there's only one authority, there's only one authority that produces everlasting fruit. Only one authority that will allow our fruit to last through eternity, and that's Jesus Christ. And so in the second week, we're going to be talking about how do you know what authority that you're under? How do you recognize what you're actually submitting to? Because sometimes it can hide from us, right? We can do things just by habit. And so the second week, we're going to talk about recognizing the authority we submit to and bringing that authority back under the Jesus Christ so that we can, that we can create fruit that lasts for eternity, all right? That's week two. Week three, we're going to be talking about the fruit that actually gets produced. How do you know if you're producing godly fruit? How do you know if... Look like it might be moving again. How do you know if you're producing godly fruit? How do you know if you're producing bitter fruit? What can you do to find out? Because if you're producing bitter fruit, you've got to go back to the soil and the vine to figure out what happened, right? But if you're producing godly fruit, you don't want to just keep that to yourself. Because godly fruit, that is going to be what you want to package up and get out to the community. God is growing something in each one of our lives. And we want to be able to take what he's growing in our lives and share it with our, our households, 
Share it with our fellowship in the body. Share it with the community. And that doesn't happen by accident. So in the fourth week, we're going to be talking about the wine as intentional service. How do you make sure that you're getting that fruit and working hard to get that out to the, to the body and to the rest of the world so that you can be known for what God is doing through you? That's week four, okay? So that's what we're covering. It's not going to be a mystery. Um, so as we go through it every week, we're going to be kind of coming back to the fact to remember that we're trying to make sure that we can produce a good name, okay, for the glory of God. And so those are going to be our four weeks as we move, move through. Um, and as we get into it, this first week we're going to be talking about the soil. We're going to be talking about the soil. The soil is, is the foundation of a good name. And so for the rest, for the next you know, 25 or 30 minutes, we're going to dig into how to produce and enrich our soil. Okay? How are we doing out there, everybody? Everybody doing good? Okay, you with me? All right, that's how we're going to spend the month. I want you guys to get excited about it over the course of these next four weeks. I want you to come back excited about what God is going to be showing us so that we can bring him glory. Okay? All right. The soil. The soil is the foundation of a vineyard. Without good soil, there will be no good vineyard. You can't grow anything. What you produce is going to be stale. Where you end is going to be a bad reputation. But today we're going to be talking about the soil, okay? So I want you to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. Okay? All right, Luke chapter 8. We're going to start reading our Bibles in verse 15. Luke chapter 8, verse 15. And before we get there... Um, talking about Luke chapter 8, this is where Jesus is talking about the parable of the soils, or the parable of the seed being scattered on various soils. And he talks about these different types of soils and what they produce, what they're able and capable of producing when the seed lands on them. Right? And at the very end, he says, he talks about what good soil is. He gives three examples of bad soil, soil that doesn't allow a crop to be produced. And then he ends talking about the good soil. And we'll read that in Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 15. It says in verse 15, But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. They hear it and they retain it, but by persevering they produce a crop. This is good soil. Good soil is founded in perseverance. It's the foundation of a good name. Because church, the bottom line here is we need to learn how to persevere. We need to know how to persevere. We need to know what it means. We need to make sure that we, when we go through hard times, don't quickly give up. We all face hard times. Storms are going to come to us all. How are you doing with your perseverance? Do you get easily frustrated? Do you, get, do you get easily anxious? What have you gone through this week? Do you start snapping at people when the pressure's on? If you're doing these things, you are having a hard time persevering. Because persevering is all about do you maintain or do you lose heart? Do you maintain or do you lose heart? There's two stories we're going to look at. They're going to show us what the key to perseverance is. Because I don't want to leave us here thinking, man, oh man, I just, I don't know how to persevere. You're telling me, Perry, to persevere, but that's easier said than done. And you're right. It is easier said than done. By definition, perseverance is hard. By definition. If it's not hard, you're not persevering. You're just floating along. But if it's hard, you have an opportunity to practice this. And so I want us to start looking at our trials as opportunities to to get better at this process. And I'm going to walk through, and I'm going to try to equip us with what we need to be able to enrich our soil, meaning increase our capacity to persevere, to strengthen our backbone. All right? And so we're going to look at two stories. The first story we're going to look at is going to be Peter. And we're actually going to look at Peter twice. We're going to look at Peter going through a story where he doesn't persevere, 
And we're going to go, we're going to look at Peter with the story of him persevering. Okay? And we're going to try to figure out what the difference is. So the first story, and let's see if I can get them one at a time, but they're both going to come up. Okay, great. So the first story is in Matthew 14. The second story is in Acts 5. Okay? And so just in Matthew 14, let's just stay there for just a moment. And let me, um, let me break it down for you guys. So in, in Matthew 14, the disciples are crossing, they're crossing the lake. And the wind is raging, a storm is raging, and then Jesus starts to walk across the water in a way that they're not aware of. They see him, and they think he's a ghost, and they get afraid. They say, but what are we going to do over here? We're going to get attacked by this ghost. And Jesus says, don't fear, it's me. And that's where we pick up, that's where we pick up in our story. Don't fear, it's me. And Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and being, beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? Peter was doing something amazing because he was listening to the word of God. He didn't get out there on his own volition. God said, come. And he obeyed, and he started doing the impossible because he obeyed God's word. But he saw that hardship. He saw those wind and those waves, and those wind and those, that got bigger than God to him. It got huge, and he started to sink. And Jesus grabbed him by the hand. Immediately, the Bible says, he didn't wait. Immediately, he grabbed him by the hand and said, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Why did Peter stop persevering? He was doing the impossible. Why did he stop? I want us to keep that question in our minds as we look at the second story. Why did Peter stop? In our second story, we find Peter again uh, in the temple courts, preaching and teaching in Acts chapter 5 with the rest of the apostles. He's teaching the good news of the name of Jesus. He's performing miracles that are blowing everybody's minds. And he's preaching in a way that the Sanhedrin does not appreciate. They grab him with the rest of the apostles. They arrest him. They throw him in jail. And an angel comes and unlocks the door and says, you know what, get back out there and keep preaching and teaching. And they go back to the temple courts and do the exact same thing that got them arrested. And so they're preaching and teaching out there, and it's not a surprise what happened. They got arrested again. And then they told, then the Sanhedrin said, stop doing that. Stop preaching in his name. We are sick and tired of this. And Peter said something that should inspire us all. He said, should we obey you or should we obey God? And then they got furious. Peter preached the gospel to them and they were furious and they wanted to kill Peter and the apostles. And then a man kept his head, Gamaliel. He was a teacher of the law and highly regarded among all the people. And he said, wait, 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 let's not... Let's not kill these men because if they're doing what God wants, we can't stop them. But if they're not doing what God wants, they'll peter out. Pun intended, right? So they'll peter out. They will not last. And so this is where we get. Verse 40, it starts out by saying, His speech, Gamaliel's speech, persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus was the Messiah. They were flogged. They weren't reprimanded. They were, there was a, there was a, a stick with leather on the end of it multiple braided cords of leather, and they were beaten. The next best thing you can do besides beating somebody with a flog is killing them. They did as much as they could to try to shut them up. And what happened? They left rejoicing. They left rejoicing. Not only did they rejoice, they persevered and continued doing, um, they continued doing what... um, what Jesus told them to do. So, for us, what was the difference? 
Peter was in both of those situations. We're talking about the same guy. Why was it different? What was the difference between the story on the lake and the story in the temple courts? This is a question for you guys. What was the difference? Tommy. Submission. Submission, okay, yeah. Yeah, Steve. The The resurrection is in between those two things. That's a great point. Okay, so in the first one, he lost focus on God, right? Of all the stuff that was going around him. And then what about the second one? He stayed focused on God. Okay, yeah, Mary. Learn from their mistakes. Okay. He spent, spent three years with Jesus. Yes, Alan. He had the Holy Spirit. Okay, yeah, Joseph. Perseverance. Hey, he persevered, but there's something in, the, in between. There was something that helped him to persevere. And so we want to get to the root of that. But yeah, he definitely persevered. Clausel. He had fear. Fear and no fear. Yeah, why though? Why? Jeff. No but words. Yeah, right. So, so, so in the narrative, there was definitely a difference in the way that they responded. Absolutely. Jerome, do you raise your hand? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, so he's, he's, he knows better what he's being called to do. He knows better with Jesus. Yeah, Julia. Removed his eyes off of Jesus in the first one, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, kept his focus on Jesus. This is great. Steve. Right, right. So he had the true definition of faith. He lost it in the first story. In the second one, he really had more of it. I love these responses. I love these responses. I specifically love the response where it said, you know, he was with Jesus for three years. That'll change you, right? Also, he witnessed the resurrection. We had a whole class series on witnesses of the resurrection and how that changed these people. And so being a witness to that kind of power changes you, right? And so he's walking with Jesus, and I love that. He was walking with Jesus, and over time, Jesus helped him to focus differently. Jesus helped him, because essentially the point that I'm getting to here is that godly focus is the key to perseverance. I think our responses all encapsulate that, is that when, when Jesus, and I'm kind of going off script here a little bit, but when Jesus sent out the apostles Two by two, the 72 of them, he sent them out, and they came back rejoicing. They were like, wow, Jesus, look at all this stuff that's happened. We were able to, get, we were able to expel demons. We were able to heal people. We think demons and spiritual powers were submitting to our name. And Jesus said, don't rejoice because these powers submit to you. Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So even as Jesus is talking to them, he's saying, stop focusing on the power that I'm giving you. Focus on the fact that you are connected to God. Focus on the promise you have that after this is over, you will be with me. So he's shifting their focus. And because of the resurrection, because he spent so much time with them, they were practiced in their focus. Matthew 5, uh, verses 11 and 12 says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, 
they per- persecuted the prophets who were, befo- who were before you. I believe the apostles were in the Sanhedrin quite possibly thinking about this passage. Because they were getting persecuted like the, like the prophets were before them. So when they were flogged, they were thinking, wow, we've been counted worthy of participating in what the apostles participated in. Our reward will be great. Without the flogging, maybe their reward wouldn't have been as great. But because they suffered for the name of Jesus, that's to their credit. God promised a reward. And so they rejoiced because of the suffering, not in spite of it, because of it. The key to perseverance was their focus. It was their focus. And so the question I have for you is what are you focusing on when you're going through those hard times in your life? What does your mind snap to? It's something for us to think about. It's a good point of reflection to think about where we go when things get hard. Because our mind is going to go where it's comfortable going, especially when the pressure's on. Our mind's going to go where it's comfortable going. This is Misty Copeland. Misty Copeland is probably one of the most famous ballerinas in the world today. She's famous because she was actually she was the first African-American ballerina uh, of, the, uh, of the New York Ballet. She didn't get there by just doing what she felt like doing. She had to train. And what you see her doing right now, she is in mid-spin. You can see her dress twirling. She's in mid-spin. But she's doing what ballerinas have been trained to do from the very beginning. It's this technique called spotting. When they spin, they keep their eyes fixed. Oh, tried to do it. Tried to do it. It didn't work. Got to get it right. There it is. All right. So spotting, right? I appreciate that. You guys set the bar pretty low, but I appreciate your love and encouragement and support. Um, But spotting, right? Spotting makes sure that when your body is spinning around and around and around, that you, your mind and your, your eyes are focused on one thing. And when you're spotting, you stay focused. You stay level. Their arms are doing graceful maneuvers, but their mind and their eyes are focused. And that keeps them steady. So the question is, what are we spotting when our lives and our circumstances are spinning all the way around us? Are we spotting? Spotting doesn't happen because you just wake up in the morning and do it. You have to train yourself to spot. You have to train yourself to focus. This is the equipment that you need for perseverance, is training. Repetition. Because if you take your eyes off of the mark, like Peter took his eyes off Jesus on the lake, you are going to sink into your circumstances. It's going to go right over your head until Jesus grabs you. Because when Jesus grabbed him immediately, Peter's eyes went off the wind and the waves, and they focused on Jesus again. And they probably walk back to the boat. I don't think that Jesus was carrying Peter like a baby, right? They walk back to the boat because Jesus had his attention. And that's what Jesus does for us. Sometimes he will stop our situation. He will get in our way. He won't let us get the things we want, so we will stop and we will focus on him. We see that, we see that all over the Bible. So Jesus is showing us a way to do things. We have to learn to focus. And he's given us an example. In Hebrews 12, Burrell brought this up last week. In Hebrews 12, it says, verses 1, it says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. The, the race is already marked out. God has already planned things in advance for us to do. We're not cutting or carving our own way. The race is marked out. We have to run it with perseverance. How? Verse 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Jesus wrote the book. He created everything. Jesus, he is the authority and the expert on what it takes to do everything of value in this life, especially persevering. And he... For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. 
Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So Jesus set the example for us of how to persevere. Jesus, the, in Peter and the apostles followed it when they were before the Sanhedrin. They fixed their eyes on Jesus, even as they were being flogged. Jesus set the example by focusing on the joy that was set before him. What was that joy? Jesus was focused on the fact that after this was done, after the cross was finished, after the cross was finished, he would have built a connection between God's treasured creation and the Father again. That we would be able to come together. We would be able to be a people again. The design from the very beginning was for the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to have us in their communion, in their relationship with them. And because of what Jesus did on the cross, we have a chance for that again. A chance to be connected and close again. That was, that was the joy. The joy set before him. Because of that, he endured all these things. He endured the shame of the cross, the shame of the beatings, the humiliation. He showed us the way. We can rejoice in the storm because we're with him. So perseverance, it's possible for all of us. We just need to practice and strengthen our focus, right? Misty Copeland trained to strengthen her focus so that she was spotting without even thinking of it. Jesus showed us the way. He showed us that we should focus on our joy as we're going through the hardships of life. But how do we practice doing that? If you give up easily, what do you do to get better? We know we have to practice, right? But what we're going to be, what I want us to realize is that focus is completely under our control. It's one of the very, very few things that we can control in our life is what we focus on. You, as you're looking at me right now, can look right at me and blur out all my features. You can do it. Like, look at the screen behind me, and you can't see my face, right? What we focus on is completely up to our control. It's the fruit of our free will, right? What we focus on is the fruit of our free will. And so what we choose to focus on, you know, is it's a matter of practice. Can you control it? And so what we need to do is we really need to practice our focus every day throughout the day. I think Jesus, you know, Jesus is one of the few things we can focus on and still do everything else well, right? I can focus on Jesus and have a great conversation with my brother. I can focus on Jesus and talk to my wife and love my wife. I'm doing it for Jesus. Jesus, help me to love my wife, right? I can focus on Jesus and go to work and Type on this spreadsheet, God, let me make this excellent for you so we can have a good reputation, Father. You can work and be focused on Jesus. You can eat and be focused on Jesus. You can do everything of value in life and be focused on Jesus. He is the one thing you can look through and do everything that you would otherwise do better. So how do we focus on Jesus? We need to focus on Jesus. And so there's a couple things that we can do because the goal here is to practice our focus, right? And is any practice... You know, you practice before the game. You practice before the game. So you want to practice your focus before you are under tons of pressure. Because when, pre when the pressure's on, it's game time, right? You're going to do whatever you're used to doing when the pressure's on, when things get hard. You're going you're gonna to do whatever comes naturally to you. The key is to change your instincts. How do you change your instincts? You change your instincts by practicing when the pressure is not on. Practicing when the pressure is not on. Do you practice focusing on Jesus when you are not under pressure? And so I want to give us a couple of ideas, because that's the principle. We need to practice focusing on Jesus when we are not under pressure. This is how we increase our capability to persevere. And so what do we do? There's a million ideas that we, can, that we can all speak to, right? we got about 10 minutes left, and I'm wrapping up here, so I want to hear some of these ideas soon from you. But a couple ideas that I want to start you with. I think we can focus, again, I think to focus on Jesus, we practice focusing on God's promises so that we can change our instincts, right? Practice focusing on God's promises so we can change our instincts. So there's a couple things that you might be able to do. I'm just going to give you two examples, both of which really work well for me. Now, these are... You know, these can be techniques. I want you to just take home the, the, the principle of it, though. Um, the first thing is fasting. 
Fasting is great for focus. Now, God tells us to fast. Jesus encourages us to fast, right? But fasting can be like a hung, it's like a, it's like a hunger alarm for your focus. So let's say we want our church to grow. And we want our church to grow, right, church? Yeah. We want people to hear the word of God. We want people to make decisions to follow Jesus. We want people to be connected with their creator and with their father. We want that. And so we should fast for that. We should be fasting for our church to grow. Not just 5%, which, amen, that's a good goal. But pray for God to give us multiples of what we have for now. Fast for that. You fast for that, and so when you're fasting for this, you know, you, you go to God, and you get hungry. Oh, man, it's day one, and ooh, I really would like some breakfast right now. You remember, why am I doing this? Oh, yeah, I want the church to grow. God, send workers out into your harvest field. You said that the, the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. Make us workers. Set a fire in the hearts of my brothers and sisters and and. Mention people's names. Set a fire in the heart of Kenny. Set a fire in the heart of Andrea. Set a fire in the heart of Jeff. Father, inflame your people with your will and pray. Pray. Why? Because you're hungry and you remember that this is what you want to focus on, right? Fasting can be like a hunger alarm for your focus, right? It's a good way to do it. But there's, there's something else, and there's a lot more that we can do. Um, and I'm going to give the second uh, idea. I think we got another, oh good, another 10 minutes here. Um, so one thing that I do is I call it focusing in fives. This is my little technique. It's called focusing in fives. And so what I do is um, I kind of take up David's example. So when David went to go fight Goliath, um, he, he didn't take Saul's armor and his sword. David said, I'm not, I, I, that doesn't fit me. I'm not used to that. I've killed lions and bears, and it wasn't with the sword and it wasn't with armor. And he went to the river, and he bent down, and he picked up five smooth stones from the river, right? Because that's what he was used to. He killed bears and lions with these smooth stones in his sling. And that's how I think about um, these, this first part of, of, of fives, right? I, I went to go pick up five scriptures that really encourage me, ones that make me almost want to cry. Because I'm thinking about God's promise. I'm thinking about God's provision and how I don't have to worry. That's going to be a different set of scriptures for each one of us. Right? We all are in different places and God encourages our heart with different things from his scriptures. But I found five. I found five that when I look at them, I just, it just changes my my countenance and my attitude. Five scriptures. And I take those five scriptures and I look at one scripture um, I, I look at the scriptures five times throughout the day, but I look at one scripture at each point. I look at the first scripture when I wake up in the morning. I look at the second scripture before breakfast. I look at the third scripture before lunch, the fourth scripture before dinner, and the fifth scripture before I go to bed. Five minutes apiece, though. I focus on those scriptures for just five minutes. I wake up and I just spend five minutes just And I don't try to tell myself what to do when I'm looking at these scriptures. I don't disciple myself with these scriptures and say, man, Perry, you should have have been doing this. You should have been doing that. That's not what I do. I look at that scripture, and I just revel in God's promise. Wow. Look at what God promised he would do. What would my life be like when this promise is fulfilled? God, thank you. Look at this. Look at how this, this is beautiful. That's all I do. I don't go and make plans for my day. I just revel in the promise of God. Just for five minutes. And you'll see those five minutes, they end up feeling like a long, it ends up feeling like two minutes or one minute when you really start to revel in the promises of God. Right? So I do that in the morning when I wake up, and then I might do my quiet time, another quiet time and pray. But I do it before I eat. So I'll stop before I eat, and I'll be like, wow, God. And here's the thing you can take five minutes. Five minutes is not a long time. Before you eat, you can take five minutes. When you wake up, you can take five minutes. Before you go to bed, you can take five minutes, right? Five minutes isn't overwhelming, is it? No. It's just five minutes, but you will be amazed at how resilient you'll become. When you're just taking five minutes, that ends up being 25 minutes a day of just soaking in God's word. Soaking in God's word. So that helps me, and I don't do it, I do it uh, every day, and it's the repetition that gets me closer. 
And so when the pressure's on, like if my wife and I have a disagreement and I felt like something went wrong and I might be tempted to get offended, my mind starts to snap. Oh, yeah, remember, God provides for you. You hide under the shadow of his wings. The, the scripture says that, that you feast on the abundance of his house and that he makes you drink from the river of his delights. Wow. Why are you so upset? Right? Or it reminds me of Ephesians where it says, man, you're, you're, you're supposed to be sacrificing, giving yourself up for her, washing her with the water of the word. Is your heart there? And so my, when I, pressure comes on, my mind snaps to the scriptures that I've been focusing on. And it steals my backbone for the pressure. Okay? So those are some ideas that I have. we got about five minutes. Do you guys have any ideas about what you do to, to practice focusing on the word of God? To practice and revel on the word of God? Is there any ideas out there? You don't have to do it all. The, if you're just having an idea and you're inspired, great. Share it. Anybody have any ideas about what you do? Wendy? You pray yourself to sleep. Okay. Yeah. Ending the day, focusing on God. It's a great way to think about what you're grateful for and, and really framing your day under God's power. Thanks, Wendy. Yeah. Anybody else? Carol? Carol? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, Carol said that when she feels anxious, she journals because it helps her to cast her anxieties on God because he cares for you. That's a promise in the scripture. So you put it down there and you feel better. Okay, it's out. God cares for me. It's a great way to settle. Kenny? A lot of times I like to um, take a scripture and touch it because uh, mm. I focus all myself and back on it. Amen. Kenny said he takes the scriptures in the morning. And then he focuses so he can take his focus off of himself and start focusing on the brothers. That's great because sometimes we can just go, get so into ourselves, right, and what we're going through. But when you are going through something and you have a scripture that's like, man, this is encouraging me, you send it to the brothers, it's, it, it does great for you and it does great for them. But thank you for sharing that. Alan. Um, sometimes I'll uh, both listen to the scriptures and read them simultaneously. Mm. What? That's, that, oh, that's a great technique. So Alan said, for those who are online, if you're hearing, that he takes the scriptures and he listens to the audio at the same time that he reads the words and it helps to give him some tunnel vision so he can focus. I need to try that one because there's times where I can feel like I got like a monkey mind. My mind is jumping everywhere. Like if I'm just listening to maybe a podcast, this happened to me on Friday. I, listened, I was listening to a podcast that helps you to kind of focus on a particular scripture and I looked up, and five minutes are gone, and I was like, I was thinking about something completely other than the Scripture, right? My focus just, just goes. But if you're looking at the Scripture and reading it, yeah, that would really help. Yeah, Julia. Mm-hmm. Mm. Right. Mm. Right. Mm hmm. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic. Spending time being still and focusing on what God has done for you in the past, reliving those successes that God has brought you through. And that encourages you for the day. The scriptures actually talk about that. It says that we have hope because we look into the past. And see all the things that God has done. And really, I'd say, Julia, you're really leaning on his name and his reputation for your hope in the future. Right? That's fantastic. It's a great technique. All right. Yeah. Allison. I love that. I love that. Long commute. And I was doing that too. Allison said she has a long commute. And so she tends to put on praise music in, in scriptures and listens to things that will focus her mind back on what God is doing so that she can absorb that instead of all the things that the world can, all the other things you can focus on if you turn on the radio. And so that's great. That used to really help me too. I, I had a long commute. I can, I can relate. Yeah.
Mm -hmm. I love that. Calling somebody and praying with them brings your focus back to God. I love that also because it's not just your heart you get to hear, but you get to hear somebody else's faith, and it feeds you as well. And so that's a great thing. Okay, so it's, it, we're, it's about time to wrap up. Let's go ahead and pray. Uh, next week, we're going to get together, and we're going to talk about the vine and, the, and putting ourselves under God's authority. Okay, so I hope you guys appreciated this class. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father God, thank you so much for being such a big area for us to focus on. God, you are huge. All the things you've done are legion. We have all these things to focus on. God, I pray that you would strengthen our perseverance. Father, that you would help us to be able to stand the test and stand the trial by focusing on you, the joy that's set before us and being connected to you. God, help us to reach out to each other. Help us to remind each other to focus on you. As we're talking to each other, we can hear the lack of focus in each other's hearts and voices. God, let us see to it that we will uh, encourage each other and not let each other be hardened by sin's deceitfulness by helping to shift each other's focus back to you. God, we depend on you. We love you. Thank you for giving us the space and time. Uh, God, keep us all healthy and happy and help us to grow this church in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, go get your kids.